Well, Basim. Pierce. It's good to see you. It's good to see you too. Um, last time, obviously, we did it remotely. Yes. You were here. I was in London. And you complained that it was an unfair <laughs> situation. You couldn't see me. Your earpiece kept falling out. Yes. So I thought, okay, fair enough. I hear you. I got on a plane. I flew six and a half thousand miles. And not only that, we're doing it in somewhere that is very familiar to you. It's the comedy store in Los Angeles where you performed many times as a stand-up. So I've done my bit. You did. You did. But actually, this is not, this is not the first time we meet in person. No, no. We yeah. did originally in, we did. in London last year. And I know that many people are watching this for the first time. I would know this, but like, I would really love to tell the story of that moment because yes. uh, I was uh, having a, a, a tour in the UK and Europe, and I was doing my English stand-up. Mm. And one of my, uh, you know, advertising promotion plan was to come on your show. So my Asian called me, like, Bessim, you're going to be on Piers Morgan. I said, damn, it's like, what's wrong? It's like, well, uh, Piers Morgan blocked me on Twitter. <laughs> I did. And, and he said, like, what did you do? I said, well, during January 6th, you know, the insurrection, you know, uh, you tweeted something about it. And I was so angry at what's happening. And I remember you having you and Donald Trump in a picture. And I said, said the guy who had Donald Trump with him, whatever. <laughs> and, and, and then I, I, I used, like, very harsh words. And, of course, you blocked me. So I, and then I said, like, does he know? I don't know. Does he know? I don't know. Does he know? I don't know. So I walked into the studio. And the moment I was like being seated and they're preparing before we go on air, and you say, like, "Oh, hi, Basim. It seems that you have more followers than me, but it seems that I blocked you. Why?" <laughs> like, oh. And I told you, and then, <laughs> then we we said the story on air, and it was funny because I made the joke. I was like, "You have always been standing against cancel culture, yeah. and you just canceled me on Twitter." But we agreed that this is not canceling because this is your own space and you're free. But now you're unblocked me, and we and are. We're, and, and we're, we're here. And um, we're here. And it was yeah. And actually, we agreed about January the sixth, by the way, just yes. for the record. Yeah, yeah, um, the I was done about you. Maybe you weren't surprised. I was completely staggered by the response globally to our interview several weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Were you taken aback by the scale of it? Uh, yes, of course, but I understand why. Um, for many years, the media covering the Middle East has uh, been um, showing a certain point of view. I'm not going to say bias, but I would say it did not allow certain voices, certain um, voices from the other side to be heard. And that is why you see the frustration. You all, whenever you speak to people in the Middle East, they tell you the same thing. Uh, they, 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 they not very happy with the, the coverage of the Middle East because our voices are not heard. Now, I am the least qualified person ever to talk about this conflict. And yet, just because I relate some of the talking points that we say and we hear the whole time, mm -hmm. people felt heard. And when, you, when, when people have this feeling, they, they, they're happy. They, are, they, 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 they have this response. They say, like, oh, my God. For the, for the first time, the West are actually hearing our point of view. Some of the point of view might not be go well with other people, but at least we have a conversation. And I think that is the reason why people reacted that way. Uh, yeah. It's, it's such an incendiary subject matter. I've never seen social media so ablaze with hostility on, on both sides. Did you actually, as well as enormous praise from the Arab world, did you also get criticised by some parts of the Arab world for not going perhaps oh, hard yeah. enough? Oh, you didn't do that, you didn't do that. Oh. The thing is, this is like, uh, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Right. If you don't speak up, why don't you speak up? If you speak up, you didn't speak up enough. If you're done, why are you done? If you speak up too much, oh, you're taking all the attention on you. And I, lo I love that fact because people always who accuse people of being the center of attention, they are actually not very happy that the attention is not on them. This is actually like a rule on social media. But yeah, there was a backlash, but there's also a backlash from the other side, which uh, I, I mean, here mm. and other comedy clubs, I worked with people from all kinds of different backgrounds, mm. uh, Jewish, Christians, Muslims, Arabs, atheists, all kinds of people. And there are a lot of people who went to my socials like, oh, so you're a terrorist sympathizer now, you know? And uh, I think it is important to have uh, a nuanced, deep, interesting, intelligent conversation. A lot of people waiting for this mm. are kind of like, yeah, Basim, bury Pierce, mm. show him. And this is the problem with the news today. The problem is the news today, it's not about the news anymore. Mm. It's about the people giving you the news. Mm. So it becomes a show, a circus, two gladiators in the Colosseum, two pigs fighting in the mud. And this is why 
people don't get anything out of it. It's a circus. You know, one of the things I heard a lot was, who is this guy? <laughs> and they weren't talking about me. Sometimes, <laughs> I, sometimes I wonder. <laughs> now, obviously, you're very, very well known in the Arab world. You're known as the kind of, they called you the Arab John Stewart, and you're well known in America, but you weren't that well known, for example, in the UK. Mm. Uh, and I think what this interview did, it, it made a lot of people think, wow, all right, this, this is incredible. Mm. But tell me more about Bassam Yusuf. And I, I did a bit of research into your life, and it is a fascinating journey that you've gone on to get here mm. to Los Angeles and I think it's worth just taking a little beat here to talk about this because you began in Cairo as a heart surgeon I mean yeah. that was your career path yes and, yes and you were a heart surgeon I was a heart surgeon until yeah uh, I, I spent 19 years in that care seven years in medical school 12 years as a practicing doctor and uh, 2011 happened and the revolution happened and I had my own show on YouTube. I did like small vi videos. Well, I'm going to come to this because yeah. I was in, I, by coincidence, I had just joined CNN to replace the great Larry yes. King. And I hadn't actually done any live show. I'd done a few weeks since I joined of taped interviews with big names, Donald Trump, Oprah Winfrey, things like that. And I was flying back to Los Angeles when I got a message that Egypt was going up in the start of the Arab Spring. And I actually went to a studio very near here, about a mile down the road on Sunset, the CNN studio, the old Larry King studio. And I went live for the first time, and it was about the Arab Spring, and it was about what was happening in Egypt. And at the same time, you, in Egypt, were actually in Tahrir Square, helping wounded protesters, actually medically treating them. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, this was a kind of movement that inspired a lot of Egyptians. Um, at the time, I was, you know, I was in the hospital, and a, a lot of people just had volunteered. Oh. And the, the nurses were just like giving us like supplies, go, 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 and we were going there. And we were basically tending to the wounded because it is, and, and it kind of gives you a different perspective when you see helpless, defenseless people who, do, who are not armed. Mm -hmm who are being beaten by security forces, military forces, being shot, being, uh, you know, hurt. And uh, all we can do is just, like, provide some medical attention. And it kind of gives you a perspective to see how humanity sometimes can show its most ugly face. And the suppression of free speech, freedom yeah. of expression. Yeah. The ability of people to say what they honestly feel about a situation. Yes. And the suppression of people's basic rights to freedom. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, that kind of like uh, taught me a lot and, uh, and inspired me to do the show. But you know... Well, you start, I mean, it's a crazy story, this. And I, I want to tell it because you just decide to do <laughs> five minute stuff on YouTube. Yeah. And you are expecting a few people to watch yeah. it. And then, literally, it just flies. And suddenly, right. you're getting millions of people watching this. And very quickly, one of the big networks comes in. Mm. And then you're suddenly doing this stuff for 30 to 40 million people. Yeah. Like a third of the entire population of Egypt yeah. is tuning in to watch it. You're the biggest star of Egyptian television. Oh, please. But you were. Don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, I mean, what an extraordinary thing, though, for a heart surgeon yeah. to go from helping protesters medically in Tahrir Square, the start yeah. of the Arab Spring, to within a year, you're the biggest star on Egyptian television. It's, it's a crazy it thing. Do, it, it doesn't sound as glamorous as this. It's, I, it feels, it, it felt horrible. Did it, why? Oh yeah, uh, overnight fame, this Scary. size, it's toxic, mm. terrible, terrible. It, 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 it corrupts, it, 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 it uh, goes into your soul and it, it's not good. It's not, I, I actually didn't enjoy it. Uh, and the worst, the, the, well, the worst part about it is that like, you're trying to do comedy in very controversial climate about very controversial issues. Mm -hmm. So you'll never, never satisfy people. And the problem is that you're, people have these expectations. Oh, if you are successful in this, you must be successful at solving this. Mm -hmm. And when things are not solved because politics, as you know, very difficult to solve, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 that expectation, this love turns into hate. And, 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 this is, uh, and this is one of many, many reasons that I had to leave and I, and I came here eventually. Well, I wanted, let's just take people through what happened, because yes. they probably don't know a lot of people. So during the presidency of Mohamed Morsi, who was a democratically elected Islamist, mm. you, you had relative freedom to start, but then the more you went after government propaganda, the more you stood up for the people against the government, then the trouble started. Morsi wanted to shut you up. You eventually get dragged through the courts. 
uh, for one day. It was a warrant for my arrest, and then I turned myself in, and I was interrogated. And it was the funniest interrogation ever. And in my stand-up shows, I, I, I talk about that scene. Because the guards were reading the stuff out and laughing, right? Well, the guards were taking selfies with me, which is funny. Right. <laughs> and and, the, uh, and, the, and it, the exchange between me and the, inter and the persecutor, a uh, general persecutor, was extremely funny. I mean, I don't like to victimize myself. I don't like, oh, look at that. I actually like to find humor. But why were the... you arrested? What was the criteria? Oh, yeah. The, I, I think the list was insulting Islam insulting the president, spreading false rumors, and disrupting the fabric of society. And, uh, and uh, it was, I think the people in the room didn't know what to do with me mm. because they ended up discussing my jokes. So it turned into a writer's room. And I, I was kind of like, how do you think we make this funnier? And it was the funniest exchange ever. And after six hours, I, I was let go. Mm. And uh, Was it scary, though, at the same time, that suddenly the machinery was getting a grip of you because it was to get a lot scarier. But was it in that moment when you first got arrested, you thought, I'm being arrested for breaching my freedom of speech, right? It, for, for some reason, I, I, I just like went with the flow. I went to the interrogation wearing the big hat. I went to the show. It's, uh, it, was, it was just, I, I just wanted this to be a farce mm. because I, I just like, you, you really, coming after the comedian and it, it was it I, I just tried to enjoy myself but deep inside I was dying <laughs> well you actually it, it gets serious enough where you may have died because actually Morsi gets of course deposed in comes a general El Sisi in a coup a military coup and he doesn't find satire a laughing matter particularly when the jokes are about him you get blocked they literally block your show from airing I aired one episode, and it's interesting. This is, this is a very interesting story because the first episode that was aired after the removal in the Muslim Brotherhood, everybody was waiting to see what I would say. Because by that time, all of the Islamic channels that were, I mean, like me and me and Islamic channels, like it's like they had five channels and they were like me and them going like that. They, they had like five channels that have only one hour a week. And then they were removed. And then a lot of the other dissident voices were also being shut down. Now, our people are waiting. What will Basim say? Mm. And on the day that the show aired, the next day I went, I went out and everybody's like, good, good, at least somebody is speaking. It was a very controversial episode. Nobody liked it. And yet everybody liked it. Because people said, like, you're supporting the coup. No, you're the Muslim Brotherhood. Everybody accused me of something. Big. All I did in that episode was just being a mirror of what is happening in the street and showing them how ridiculous it is. You didn't take a fixed position. Well, my position, uh, depending on where, wh what's your position? What did you intend your position? To? My, my position was to show the ridiculousness of <clears throat> how the pe people now was like, oh, we got rid of Islamic fascism, but we are heading towards another fascism. Mm. Uh, there was, and there was a song that I did that was very controversial. People, and it's very funny, the, the pro-Muslim Brotherhood thought that this is a disrespect to the people who died. And on the other side, the people said that this is a disrespect to the army. And when you manage to offend everybody, you know you're right. Yes. And then the people in the middle, it's like, oh, you weren't, you weren't tough enough. And yeah. I was told, it's like, why didn't you go after? The, 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 free, the ceiling of freedom just went down. And I was just like, it was very difficult. It is very difficult to go against pa uh, an, uh, an authority that is very that was very popular at the time and especially a military authority with oh, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of experience oh yeah of weaponizing these situations yeah you had death threats people would always choose most of the time they would always choose the military form rather than the religious form because mm. they they kind of like uh, at least they are not infringing on my personal freedom not yet but uh, well, you had threats on your life didn't you oh all the time i don't talk about that because like i have been having death threats like they never stopped since 2011. They never stopped. Have they continued since our last interview? Oh, yeah. They never stopped. People threatening to kill you? All the time. Wh why? For what reason? Oh, uh, for just saying something that they don't like. Oh, because you, you are against uh, Egypt, you're against Islam, you're against our president, you're mm -hmm. against God. It, it never stops. It never stops. It doesn't, yeah. doesn't bother you? I mean, if you die, you die. You know? If you die, you die. I mean, w w since, since when, whatever, like, <laughs> nobody guards deflected a, uh, a bullet, you know, uh, maybe. 
the guy who would Ronald Reagan. But <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I think it's like whatever, ha even like at a certain point, I actually had like private security. Mm -hmm. And then I told him, I can't, I, I cannot live like that. Mm -hmm. if, if that's my destiny, if I die, I'll just die. You end up with your lawyer saying, you've got to get out of here. You've got to get out of Egypt. It's yeah. getting too dangerous. Yeah. Something bad's going to happen. You're going to yeah. get arrested again and probably sung in jail. Or you're going to going to try and kill you. And you flee to Dubai. Mm -hmm. And then you end up here yeah. in America. Yes. Was that always the plan to eventually come to America? Or was it expediency because of what happened? Well, it's funny that you said that because I visited the United States after the first year of my show. Mm. And uh, um, a doctor that's there, an Egyptian doctor has been there for, for a while, I said, listen, Bessem, you, you are very visible in the media, and I think you can use that to apply for a green card as a special talent. And I did. And I said, look, I, I, I have like a huge show in It's actually the criteria, because I have the same, yeah. is... Uh, an alien of exceptional ability. Yes. Is what they call you. Yes, we're very, Charmingly. Yes, we're very we're exceptionally able aliens. We are, but we are still aliens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, it always makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah. like, you can come here, but you are an alien. You're an alien, but you're exceptional. Yeah. And uh, I, um, I just I, I applied for it, and I got it. Uh, I got the Time 100 that helped bo both from my, uh, my application. I said, ah, maybe I'm not going to use it. And then when that happens, ooh, that green card came handy. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think that I'm here on asylum. I'm not. I just, it was just, a, a, a strike of luck. You now do stand up. Mm -hmm. and you've done it for five years, and fascinatingly, you do some of it for an Arab audience. You have a whole in show in Arabic, and a, and an English-speaking yes. version. Yeah, and they're probably very different, right? Totally because different. Different sensibilities, different humour, yeah. different crowds, yes. different expectation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, well, the uh, Arab audience come to my show. They expect that's going to be another version of my show that I did in Egypt, and I said, no, it's a my personal story. And if, when the Arabs look, uh, to come to my English shows, like they think it's like an English version of the mm -hmm. of the shows, like no, it's a different story. Even then, this weekend, right before I met you, because of our interview, I sold out Arizona. Really? <laughs> yes. And I and I and I stood. And the first thing I said, like, who here came because of the Piers Morgan show? I was like, ah. I was like, <laughs> I was like, boy, you're gonna be disappointed <laughs> because this is not about that. But isn't that amazing? I mean, yeah. that shows the power of that interview. Yeah. Resonating even in in Arizona here. Amazing. Yeah. Because I don't I don't want to be I don't want to succeed just because of a trending moment of time. Mm. It is the sh same show that I've been working and perfecting, and like any stand-up comedian in the United States, your dream is what? Is to sell you special to mm -hmm. platforms like Netflix or HBO, and you, you want to get there, because for me, that was like a, uh, like a, re like a rebirth. Mm. Because I thought like everything was lost. I came here, I had nothing. Uh, uh, the first three, four years, uh, it was terrible. The first two years I was doing stand-up, oh, I bombed hard. I bombed hard, and I, I went home crying. I said, like, I'm not going to make it. And then suddenly, I have already a tour. I mean, even before our show, I already had a set tour. Mm. And now I'm having like this ability of like talking to people with different languages, talking to all these different languages. The show that I did in Arizona had an incredible mix of Arabs and Americans. Amazing. And they came here, and they completely, for and there, a lot of them came, they were Palestinians. Mm. And they came with, with like the Palestinian flags and the cafe. And I thought, it's like, guys, it's like the way, uh, Laughter, being good at your job, in, is in, in its way a, a way of resistance. Because when you laugh, when you, tell, when you show people that, hey, we have Arab people here, and they are, by the Arabs and Palestinians population in Arizona, one of the most established population in the United States. Arabs in the United States in general, mm. they are like professionals, doctors, engineers, mm. professors. Even the Uber drivers, they are probably were like an engineer or mm. s someone very established there, but he had to have like a step down in order to come here and survive. Mm. So, uh, w w I mean, we, don't, we, we, we hardly come find like illegal aliens here from or people that like, came in that were not qualified. So the, and this is the problem of, this is why the reason people were very happy of our interview because, for, for, because part of the hate on both sides is that we see the news from a different perspective. Mm. And people here see the news from another perspective. And everybody's like, why are those people reacting like this? Mm. Because they don't see what the other person sees. And I hope in that interview that we can bridge that gap. Yes. Before, so, before we, can I, can I, can yes. I show? Uh, okay, so this is a gift from me and my wife. <laughs> this is uh, olive oil from the West Bank. Huh? Whenever you go to, I go to Jordan a lot, mm. but my wife also like, ask for the oil from the West Bank. It's, it's very good. Uh, oh, 
It is the best oil ever. And the thing is, the olive trees, they, they know they survive up to 600 years. Mm -hmm. And they are passed from one generation to the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it is like a family heritage. And the way that you do it, so this is zaatar. Mm -hmm. Zaatar is basically thyme, and you add to it sesame and a bunch of herbs. And the way that you eat that, you take like a piece of bread. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do it now, maybe at the end of the interview. Yeah. We'll do, yeah. And you basically, you soak it a little bit in the oil, yeah. and then you take the zaatar. And I'm, I'll demonstrate here. And then here. I love it. Love well, it. I love Arabic food. So I, at the living, end of the interview, you're, you're living with this oil. So I will yours. take that. It shows that. Well, yeah. thank you. And it's very kind of no. your wife. Thank you. No. Thank you very much for me. Well, I'm the one who bought it, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you started the last interview with, I mean, I would argue, savagely dark humor involving your wife. Mm -hmm. How you've been trying to kill her and she was using your kids as human shields and stuff. And I, I'll be honest and with I'm you. I'm still trying to. <laughs> but I. But you know what? When I failed, you know what I did. Mm. I went out to the house and I just like randomly slapped other neighbors. So you know, it's interesting. When, by mistake. Now this time I'm ready for you, okay? This time I'm ready for the humor. <laughs> oh, you're ready, okay. No, but it's interesting because last time I was very taken aback. <laughs> and I remember thinking as you were doing this at the, right off the top, I remember feeling very uncomfortable, unusually uncomfortable, and thinking I didn't know how to react to that. I didn't know whether I was supposed to laugh or be silent, or, and I sort of ended up sort of slightly grimacing, half laugh and listening. And then I realized it was very powerful what you were doing. It was satirical, but it was savagely satirical and extremely effective. And that's why I think the interview did so well. But I'm not going to pretend that I found it easy <coughs> to listen to it or to react to it, because I didn't. You know why? Because all I did was just take the talking points that's been in the media, mm. not just for mm. after October 7th, all through the conflict. It's always like, we need to kill it. All right. You need to kill five? No, kill ten. You need to kill some? No, kill all. This is what satire does. You take, uh, take reality, flip it on its head, exaggerate it, and then you can see how sometimes very uncomfortable and even sometimes stupid that sounds. Mm. Because I, I was just reacting to whatever the media is telling me. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, okay let's do it. Go, mm. um, there's no pushback. So suddenly, the person who was proposing the most extreme measures is like, oh, we'll take it, oh, no, 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 that's too much. So that, that was like a very simple technique. I just talk, took the talking point and just exaggerated it. Was, it was devastatingly effective. I yeah. Um, first, before we go any further, how is your wife's family? Because she is half Palestinian. Yeah. Are they okay? Are no, they... They're, they're good. They're good. They are safe for now. Yeah. Um, in as like the last week, there was no internet, as you have. Yes. You know, I, I saw you tweet at the IDF. It's like, how can they know? If you know how many uh, views that tweet? That nearly 40 million. Yeah. Me just saying, how are they going to see this message if you've cut the yeah. internet? Off? Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if the IDF's like, why aren't the Palestinians liking my tweet? Because they don't see it. Right. <laughs> no, but I thought that was a perfectly yeah. correct yeah. assessment of it. Yeah. Um, but the reaction to that tweet I did was enormous, as everything is in this, mm. in this thing. And I had a lot of people say, finally, Piers, you get it, right? Finally, you get it. And, and I wanted to say, listen, I'm, I'm trying to reach a place where I get this. Mm -hmm. It's an incredibly complicated issue mm -hmm. for someone who is not Arabic or Jewish to poke their head into. And I've had to cover it as a journalist for a long, long time. I think I said to you before that I was editor of a Daily Mirror in England when we opposed the Iraq war, for example. So, you know, I have taken stands on this thing. On this one, I find, and I'm going to be completely straight with you, I discussed this with Jordan Peterson um, mm. this week, and he did a pretty incendiary tweet in which he said, give them hell, Netanyahu, enough is enough. And he was actually very self-reflective about that in the interview we did this week, where he later issued a 20-minute video, because he said sometimes a, a one-line tweet can be unnecessarily inflammatory to people much better to take time to explain it. Here's, here's where I've got to with this conflict now. I viewed what happened on October the 7th as a, an absolutely appalling atrocity, a terror attack of unimaginable horror. And I absolutely think that Israel has a right to defend itself from the people who committed it, Hamas. And I've questioned for the last three, four weeks, what is a proportionate response? And I have said repeatedly, I don't know the answer. I want people who have a view to have a view about that. And I'll ask you 
again, about where you think we are with this. I also acknowledge that Hamas live among civilian population in Gaza, and therefore if you do what the Israelis are currently doing, which is a ground offensive into Gaza, a lot of civilians are going to get killed. And at what point does that become disproportionate or even illegal? And I don't know the answers to those questions. And I have a moral quandary because my instinct is to say that Israel has no choice but to respond to what happened in a very forceful manner. I understand why they want to eliminate Hamas altogether. I understand that if they feel they can, then perhaps we can move to a, a, a two-state solution or peace or whatever it may be, although I don't think Netanyahu will ever be the person to do that. But the, the moral question for me is at what point does this become disproportionate? And when you see thousands of children being killed in Gaza, it fills me with utter horror. And then people say, well, do you condemn it? And I find it very easy to condemn Israel turning off the water, Israel turning off the power. I think it's ridiculous that Israel should have that power over millions of people who are not part of their country. I think it's terrible what's happening in the West Bank with the settlers. I think that the stuff there is completely easy to condemn. But can I hand on heart condemn Israel trying to destroy Hamas after what they did on October the 7th? That is where I'm struggling to find myself saying I condemn it because I believe that they are right to try and destroy Hamas. Now, what do you feel about my moral quandary? Well, there is, there's a lot of points, very lot, and I think it, this, is, this will kind of like uh, lay the ground rules for that uh, interview. There is a whole thing about like, is it right to defend itself, the condemnation? First of all, let's start with condemnation. Yes. You want my opinion? Yes. Condemning Hamas or condemning Israel? Yes. Completely useless. Mm. Completely useless. Why? You, I condemn Hamas, you condemn Israel, interview is over. What happened? Nothing. Mm. It is just checkpoint, like morality checkpoints. But I've interviewed a lot of pro-Palestinians, for example, some of whom will immediately say, I unreservedly condemn the terror attacks of October the 7th, mm -hmm. and then go on to criticize yeah. Israel. And I think that's a very, well, it's a position I can completely respect. Yeah. But I find it much harder to respect a pro-Palestinian guest on my show if they simply resolutely refuse to say yeah. that they can condemn the terror yeah. attacks. Yes. I find that less yeah. worthy of respect. But you see, this is the problem with the news. We go into the circular motion of the same as one thing that I have noticed, mm. not just on the coverage of these events, the, 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 uh, the events before and before and before, every time this starts, people say, we don't know what's happening. It's a very complicated situation. Right. What is happening now? And for me, as a viewer, if a conflict that's been there for 75 years and the media with all this technology has been covering it and we hear the same exact words, we don't know what's happening. It's complicated. It's a very complex. That is a failure of the media apparatus. That is the failure to themselves and for the audience because why every time this happens, it seems like it is happening from, from, from point zero. And I think to help understand that, I will get to the f October 7th. I will get to the condemnation. I will get to the self-defense. But I think maybe we can do, we, we have like all the time in the world yeah. and we can discuss, this, could, this interview could be a bookmark, yeah. landmark for maybe looking at that conflict yeah. in a deeper way that nobody had gone there before. Yeah. We have the views, we have people waiting, yes. you know, as I said, I'm the least qualified to discuss that, but it's an opportunity not, to use listen, it. I'm not massively yeah, well qualified uh, uh, myself. Yeah, both of us. Like, a, I, I mean, look Irish, at us. I'm two, an Irish Catholic. I right? mean, look at us. Yeah, two privileged people. One white, one mm. one white, white wannabe, <laughs> discussing <laughs> discussing the, the the most complex conflict of mm. of our of our history. But I want to start in a totally different area. I want to start with anti-Semitism. Yes, I think it's an important issue. Yes, I think. There is a rise of anti-Semitism in the world. And I think there is, uh, this is very dangerous. And I, as a Muslim who has been through events where there were terrorist attacks somewhere, mm. and that reflects to us, on us, I, uh, I can completely, uh, completely feel that. I, uh, since what happened, I had text messages from the Jewish friends. Are you okay? Are you, are wife's family okay? And I was texting them, well, are you okay? Are you? And I think it is very important to agree on the language because the word anti-Semite 
has been used and abused and most most of the time not f on for you know for the good in, um, interest of the Jewish people because the first two days of the coverage I watched the news and I and there was a lot of um, protest that was led by Jewish Voice for Peace and they were led by people who opposed the Israeli attack on the civilians and I remember quite well many of the Republican representatives in Congress came out and they were calling these the global intifada, the global jihad. I love it when they say jihad. They sound like a horse. Jihad. <laughs> it's very funny. Uh, or they, uh, they say, like, these are, and I quote, Iranian-backed jihadists. Mm -hmm. And I said, wait a minute, but most of those people are Jewish. Those people who took over the capital, the same people who took over Central Station in New York, which is known as the biggest civil disobedience event in America in the last two decades. They were all Jewish. And then I find Nikki Haley saying anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism. And then I remember it's like, oh, Jewish people in America are saddled by the fact that they are not citizens of America or citizens of the world, but they are citizens of Israel. And they have to back Israel in whatever they do. And these are not my words. These are the words of John Stewart. He went out and he said, and said like, and he said it's very, very important to divide these two. And what is very, very interesting... What, would you compare that on that specific point to the way that people try and say all Palestinians are responsible and accountable for oh, what Hamas do? Yes, uh, yeah. In other words, I think you can be very critical of Israeli government oh, and their policies yes. and Benjamin Netanyahu and the politicians, but that doesn't mean that you have to take that criticism to innocent Israelis who may have exactly the same criticism themselves. And this is why it is very important to have these kind of discussions, because it, it, the funniest, not the funniest, the saddest thing that I saw is the people that were in so much support of Israel mm. are anti-Semite themselves. MTG, MTG, MTG uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, mm. You know, she said like, oh, those are, I send my aides and they took pictures of the protesters. Basically, she's surveilling protesters. And uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is very known for a very famous post in 2018 where she blamed the California wildfire uh, fires on a Jewish space laser gun. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? I was just like, oh, they were burned because Jewish investors, Rothschild and Finstein, anything was that ends with time, because that's of course sounds Jewish. They put a satellite and shooting laser beams to... It's, it's possible. And, and, and not just her. You have uh, Steve Scolalis. Scula, uh, 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 Scolalis, uh, thank you so much. Uh, he is the, now the, the speaker of the house, and he, he has been invited before in a, in a, in a, for an organization that was funded by David Duke, the founder of the KKK. You have Kevin McCarthy, who is the former minority speaker, uh, uh, leader of the Republican Party in the House, and he accused Jewish billionaires of rigging the midterm. So how come those people are accusing us of anti-Semites? So here's the thing. So go, let's go to the equation that Nikki Haley put on Twitter. Anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism. No, it is true. People who hate Jews, they're also anti-Zionists. It is true. And you could be someone who hates Zionists, who don't like Zionism, uh, and you are Semite, you could even be Jewish. Mm. And guess what? You could be a Zionist, like those people, uh, supporting Israel, and at the same time you hate the Jews, because the chant, Jews will not replace us, these echoed in Charlottesville. It did not echo in Gaza. I mean, in Gaza they say war stuff in, in between the bombing, under downtime. But, and these are the same people who are seen with Nick Fuentes. With, uh, right. uh, with, with, well, with, with, with Stephen with Bannon. And you know what's Donald most Trump interesting? Donald had him for dinner yes. at Maralaka. And all of those people are buddies with Benjamin Netanyahu. Mm. So how does this work? Mm. How does this work? Mm. And you know the people who speak against this? Like John Stewart, like Bernie Sanders, like uh, Naomi Klein? What do they call these people? What do they call them? Self-hating Jews. And you know what else they, now they call them? They call them Kapus. Mm. Kapus. You know what's Kapus? Kapus, basically these were the Jewish inmate in Auschwitz that were forced by the Nazis to stand as guards on their own inmates. You see how degrading this is. Mm -hmm. And this is the way to shut down conversation. Mm -hmm. Anti-Semite, Islamophobe, you hate America, you hate the military, you hate Egypt, war on Christmas. This is how you shut an environment 
that does not allow disagreement is not an environment made for let growth. It's okay. an environment made for control. Let me ask you this. On, say, the student protests in yes, America, sir. a university. I have no problem instinctively with students protesting. Mm -hmm. It's actually part of the DNA of being a student, right? But I do have a problem with two things. One, the protests that happened almost immediately after October the 7th, within hours, which were clearly deeply, deliberately inflammatory and hurtful mm -hmm. to Jewish people. Secondly, I have a real problem with the students who were beaming direct pro-Hamas slogans onto buildings on campuses in America. You know, I'm all for free speech, and I really am. The whole show is predicated on that. But not to the point where you see Jewish students barricaded into libraries because a mob is descending on them. There is a distinction to me between people who are obviously overtly... I mean, there was a professor at Cornell University who was literally seen in public shouting how exhilarated he felt by the attacks of October the 7th. Mm -hmm. He still hasn't been fired, that guy. Mm -hmm. I think that crosses a line. Do you? Yeah. I do not like this way. I mean, I can understand why, but I don't condone it. I would never, because you have to understand, these people, again, I'm not supporting them. Uh, I, I just want to make sure about two things. The reason that I started with anti-Semitism, because I wanted to make sure to clear any confusion mm -hmm. that when I speak about Israel, I'm speaking about Israel. Yes. When I speak about Jewish people, I'm speaking about Jewish people. Yes. When I speak about my Zionists, I speak about my Zionists. It would very, because no, I, I think it was yeah, very powerful that you did that. Yeah, I, I have and to be careful. That's the first thing you did, because I think it's really important. Yeah, but at the same time, when I tell you why does that happen, it doesn't mean that I condone it. There's a difference between explanation mm. and justification. Those people who are exhilarated, the way that they... See, this is the, the, the same uh, reason why people were so happy about the interview. Mm. What do they see? They see Israel as a, a criminal state who is killing their people, and in the same time, they are supported by the international community and the, the American. They have no guns. They have no superpower backing them. All they have is just the feeling of happiness, like, yes, our enemies that we cannot touch them has been hurt. All they can think about mm. that these are their enemies that have been hurt, right? I'm not condoning this, but again, it, it, like when people were uh, celebrating terrorist attacks, you know, against Western, uh, Western targets, of course I don't condone that. But why? Because those people have been, from, from a very young age, what have they seen? They're not being heard by the media. The, the plight and the suffering of the brothers in, Israel, in, in Palestine, in the Arab world, are not being here. People in Iraq, mm -hmm. you know, like when, when America and Britain invaded Iraq, mm -hmm. right? What, do, what do the Arabs saw? It's like two superpowers are coming in on, on just regular people. So whenever there was like a bomb or like an mm -hmm. attack on American troops, people would celebrate. Yeah, there are enemies. Emotions are very inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And it is not right. But those people had nothing else. All they say is just like shout. All they say is like to, to, to rejoice. It is not right. Again, I'm explaining why is this happening because it's like, yeah, if I cannot get you, I'm just going to scratch your eyes. Mm. I'm going to scratch your eyes because, because you've been beating me all the time and you have the whole international community backing you up and all I can do is scream. Mm. Is it right? No. But it is understandable. Again, it's not the right thing. But I, no, it's not like understandable. It's like, oh, I, 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 no. But again, it is an explanation. Now, hate. And again, this is another way why this has been magnified in the media so much. What does the Western audience see? They see people rejoicing for the death of innocent civilians in Israel. This is what have the Arabs seen for years in, 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 uh, on the Arab world. For example, if you look up Sidrot Cinema, this is in 2014 when Israel, when Israel was bombing Gaza as usual, and the Israelis in the Sidrot, uh, uh, the kibbutz or the, the settlement, they, were sit, they went on a hill and they had popcorn and they had drinks and they were like watching the show and they were cheering with every rocket coming down. This is what we see. Western media, people didn't see that. Well, somebody found a tweet actually of mine. Yeah. from 2014, mm -hmm. in which I said, at what point does what Israel is currently doing to the Palestinian people become terrorism? Mm -hmm. And because I've always said, you know, I've spoken about this a lot over the years, and I've always tried to be extremely fair-minded, albeit nobody really wants you to be fair-minded. They want you to take a side. But that was clear that my thinking back then was that they were absolutely overstepping absolutely. the mark. Absolutely. But um, again, to the point of rejoicing. No, I know what you mean. Yeah. Is but it, like if you, yeah. for example, Google, Google 
the wedding of hate. Mm. This is like an, a Jewish wedding in Israel where they were celebrating the arsons and no, the no, burning seen, of, of Palestinians. No, but but I'm, I'm, to be clear, I've seen lots of videos. No, 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 but like, I'm not talking to you, Pierce. No, no, I know. I, I'm, no. I'm talking to the Western audience because, no, I, because I, I want to see, like, I want to say, like, this is what they mm. see. I mean, for example, there is a very famous video for Samuel Ab Abu Zanin, who is like a young kid that he was shot point blank by an Israeli soldier and he was not allowed to have any medical attention. Mm. And as his dead body was being put into the ambulance, the Jewish settlers were cheering. Mm. So for an Arab audience, this is what we see every day. Mm. So when they see, oh, we heard them back, mm. we heard their people like they heard back, it is not right. But this is what hate does. Mm. It escalates, it feeds each other. Radicalism feeds it. It is terrible and it is, a, a, it is just like a vicious circle. So I would like to do something that is very interesting mm. today. I want, when I invited John Stewart to my show, as much of like a reception that you, if, if you've seen the YouTube, people just like, no, sorry, sorry. we had to cut the five minutes standing ovation mm. for broadcast. People were on their feet for mm. five minutes. They could not believe it. I remember uh, John Stewart telling me, I could never imagine that a Jewish guy from New Jersey would have that kind of reception in Cairo. Mm. And yet, on the internet, people who would have, what, mm. you brought a Jew on your show? Why you are with a Jew? Yes, hate is there, yes. So. And the, and the thing is like why we do not see each other, people in the Middle East, people in the West, that we do not put ourselves in each other's sh uh, shoes. And I want to do something very interesting today. I want to give, I, I'm, 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 I like telling stories. And I'm going to tell you a very nice story. Tell and this way. is the story, surprise, surprise, of the suffering and the plight of the Jewish people. And I want to say that because it is very interesting when you see the trauma and the suffering that the people on the other side went through, you might understand why, why they're coming through. So this is, see this? Mm -hmm. This is a map of all of the history of the expulsion of the Jews in Europe. They've been like, I have not, never seen a minority being kicked around this much, right? And of course, this comes back to the, you know, the whole idea about the original sin that you have uh, betrayed uh, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, the, 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 the blood of Jesus is on your hand. And then comes the 11th century. At that time, Jewish people were not allowed to own land. They were just peasants. Even some of the professions were not even allowed to participate in. But they were allowed to do one thing, usury, money lending, because it was prohibited by the Catholic Church to engage into that. So what happens when you work in money? You get richer, right? And those Jews lived in ghettos. Now, ghettos was not just like isolated neighborhoods and cities. Sometimes ghettos were outside the city. This is like how isolated they were. And in those ghettos, they have to pay gold to the mayor or the governor or the prince or the noble. So they would say, mm, you're getting richer. I need more taxes. So they pay tax. What happens when you have a business and they increase your rent? You increase your service, increase the taxes. Increase the so what happened? What the Christians started to default. And suddenly, the image of the greedy Jew was created. Shylock, merchant of Venice. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. You know, like never did I see uh, known a, uh, a creature uh, uh, like you know, uh, like like uh, I can't remember that. I never did I saw like a, a creature that looked like a man so keen and greedy, uh, oh, confound, uh, so confound of a man. I'm, I, you know, English. I messed it up. Anyways, but this is this is, was the image, greedy Jew, the greedy Jew. This was created because of their conditions, and it came became worse in 1095, when Pope Urban II called for the first crusade to go and and and, and save the birth the birth of Jesus from the unbelievers Muslim, and you know this crusade did not kill a single Muslim. You know how many people they killed? Two thousand Jews. Because it's like, wait, the non-believers are all over there. Why? Them? So they went to the, it's called the, the Crusades of the Rhineland. So they went to the Jewish community because, hey, we own the money. So let's kill them better than paying them. And then came the plague. And then all of the things like, oh, they're killing babies, babies. Who would that do that to a baby, you know? And they accused them of, of poisoning the well. This was the kind of oppression that the Jewish people went through. Fast forward 19th century, there was like the Eastern Jew in Ukraine and, and Russia, and there was the Western Jews in Europe. 
those people in the East, the Eastern Jews, had to immigrate because they were pogroms and they were like, you know, kicked out. And that at a certain point, the people in the West, especially in England, it's like, mm, there are too many Jews. We need a solution. The solution for what? For the Jewish problem. So it's like we need to get rid of them. And you know what? Palestine was not even on the, in the A list. Palestine on the, was in the B list. Because England proposed 6,000 square miles in Uganda for the Jews, 1903. And the reason why Palestine was not on the list, that it was objected by a lot of rabbis that said, like, it's a promised land, but only when the Messiah comes. But uh, there were other options, Argentina, South Africa, Uganda, Madagascar. And eventually, they said, all right, let's do Palestine. So they went to Palestine in 1914. There was 700,000 people living in Palestine, 3% were Jewish. 1917, Belfort Declaration. Arthur Belfort, he called the Jewish people in England that they are alien and hostile race. And the thing is, the only Jewish member of the parliament, of the English parliament, Lord Montenegro, he objects, said, like, these are British citizens. They, we should not kick them out. So they pushed him, they pushed him, but it was not going fast enough. Came the Nazis. And then it was not about the solution anymore. It was the end losing, the final solution by Hitler, because he needed an answer for the Jewish question, the Jude Frage. And then, the, as you see, the Holocaust happened, the most orchestrated, industrialized, horrible genocide in our modern time. Six million Jews died. So it accelerated, and they went. First of all, they left East Europe, and they went to West Europe, and they went to America, and they were turned down, and they were pushed towards Palestine. So by 1948, right before the declaration of the State of Israel, there were two million people living there. Only 30% of them was Jews. So the whole idea of like a land without a people to a people without a land it was a marketing thing. They were already Palestinians. So suddenly, from our perspective, the Jewish problem is not a Jewish problem, is not a Middle Eastern problem, is not an Arab problem, it is a European problem. It was pushed on us together with the guilt because now we are the anti-Semite. We are, now we are the Jewish hater. And not just that, they took land. So people look at this like, why are we even, we, we had a lot of refugees coming in. And during that, there was a lot of, as you know, Zionist militia, the Aragon, the Haganah, all of these people were killing Palestinians, the, the, the famous massacre of Deir Yassin. You're talking about the atrocities of October 7th, it's horrible. But in the Arab mind, there is Deir Yassin, where there is an incredible movie called Tantura, T-A-N-T-O-U-R-A, where they, the, the Israeli members of those uh, 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 militias, they talk about the atrocities that they did, including opening up the pregnant woman bellies and ha having bets if the boy inside is a boy or a girl. It is one of the most horrific, and they talk about it, some talk about it with regret, and some talk about it with pleasure. We did that, right? Mm -hmm. So you have uh, even King David, I think your Prime Minister, Mr. Sunak, was there. And I, as I, if I was British, I would question this. Because as you know, King David was bombed by the Aragon militias. Mm -hmm. 91 British soldiers died. I don't know, as a, if I was British, how come my Prime Minister would have the nerve to stay in that hotel. I mean, you know, the ghost of the 91 British soldiers, that must be haunting for them, you see? So when you see all of that, and you see that suddenly, overnight, 1948, there were 1. 1. 1.5 million Palestinians, seven, half of them, three quarters of them were overnight pushed into refugees. Yeah. And this is why it's called the Nakba, the catastrophe. So now we have all of this building up into the minds. And, that, and so, suddenly this was like a conflict, a hate, a problem that we didn't have to do anything with. This was basically pushed on us by the Europeans. You see, so this is why it is important to say that. And I'm not saying that just like, oh, let's wipe out the state of Israel. Let's like push them in the sea. No, but it's important when you talk about the conflict, that you talk about the root causes, right? No, there, were a, there was like a vibrant Palestinian culture happening over there. And right now they are erasing this culture. Suddenly I'm seeing of like Israeli feta cheese. Israeli hummus, oh, that's an insult. Israeli hummus, come on, I mean, take the land, but leave the hummus, man. I mean, come on, I mean, that's, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. You are someone who's always spoken against culture, uh, uh, cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Right now, a whole culture is canceled. Let me, let me ask you this. Jonathan Friedland is a top Jewish journalist for the Guardian newspaper. He wrote a very interesting column last week in which he said, at the root of all this, you could argue you have two sets of people with just cause and they believe passionately in their just cause. 
and he was sort of advising people not to take sides unless you really understand the history. Do you, would you agree with that? Would you agree that both sides have legitimate just cause? Not with the methodology that's, listen, you've given an extremely detailed analysis of the build-up to what happened in 48. To me, it's pretty clear, 700, 800,000 Palestinians were displaced from their Overnight. homes. And it should never have happened. And that has been absolutely, I think, the root cause for so much resentment. But can you, at the heart of this debate, agree with Jonathan that you could argue there is just cause on both sides? There's a, there is a cause on both sides, but I, I, I'm, I'm walking on a tightrope here because yeah. I'm not a Palestinian. Yeah. Uh, but from the Palestinian point of view, th there's a lot of people, I mean, there are 2.2 million people living in Gaza. There are 3.5 million people living in the West Bank. There is 350,000 people living in East Jerusalem, and there is like si 6 or 7 million people living outside. Those people, the Palestinians that were pushed out, they do not have the right to go back. Right now, if you meet Palestinians, you'll see them wearing a necklace with a key. That key is their house that they were kicked out from in, in Yaffa and in Haifa. You know, like my, my, my wife's family comes from Ramla, which is 50 miles from Gaza. And, and, and according to the law, those people have absolutely no right to go back. Even you, if you are a Palestinian with an American passport, they give you hell in order to go in. And yet, a Jewish person born anywhere in the world, born in Poland, born in the Ukraine, no question as he can jump on a plane, land in Israel, and get the, uh, the, the, the Israeli citizen and take a house that most probably belonged to a Palestinian. So it is not just like, a, it is an ongoing injustice that has been happening. Now, I mean... Where would you criticize, if you're being fair-minded, where would you criticize from 48 onwards the behavior of the Arab side? Well, put yourself uh, in the Arab side. In 1948, you constituted 70% of right. the population. Suddenly, the UN is giving you 48% of the land, right? Not just that. I mean, the, the Arab regimes, because they did terribly. And this is the thing. Like, Arab nationalism at the height of nationalism, these people feed on each other. You know, because it's very, very important to have a problem. Mm. Oh, it's Israel. And, then, and for Israel, oh, it's the Palestinian. It's a very good distraction. I mean, sometimes I feel that, like, the Palestinian cause is very useful for both sides to stay there as attention because it's always a way to reflect. But, uh, and this is a very important question because the, in the mind of the Western audience, mm. they always thought of the Palestinian resistance or the Palestinian side as, like, Islamic, as militant. No. As a matter of fact, some of the early suicide bombers were female Christian Palestinians because they, like the IRA, you know, they were fighting for a land. The whole idea of Islamization of the whole cause came very later. As a matter of fact, you will find this very interesting because when I saw this, I did not believe it. This, you know, the Fatah movement, which is the PLO, the of course, Fatah. Of this was their uh, slogan. Can you see? You see... There's a crescent, a cross, and a menorah. And they say, unitary, democratic, non-sectarian. So basically, in the 1960s, Fatah were basically marijuana smoking tree hugger hippies. And yet that didn't work, right? And the thing is, I always hear that like Arabs were giving two, four, so many chances for peace. That is not true. As a matter of fact, all along history, Israel didn't give an inch of land by peace. 1974, uh, 73 war. They gave back Sinai because uh, Egypt, like, initiated the war. 2006, they went out of uh, south of Lebanon because of the resistance they have. Even the disengagement of, of Gaza, they didn't do it out of the goodness of their heart because they had too much casualties. And even, even, even the Oslo Accords, the peace treaty, the one that Isaac Rabin and uh, got the Nobel Prize for, they did it because of the Intifada. So what is the message that Israel is giving to the Arabs? I will never give you anything with peaceful resolution. You will always have to fight for it. Do you not think that, for example, I mean, Bill Clinton feels this very strongly, that there was a great deal to be done, and Arafat, just in the end, having indicated the whole time that if we got to this place, there would be a deal, just walked away. That that was the closest that everybody came, and that actually, I mean, could Clinton have done any more than he tried to do then? I am not, again, that's why it's very important to have people who are much more qualified than me to talk about this, but two things I can say about that. 
Number one, uh, the, the whole thing about the Oslo Accord, there was a video for Netanyahu who was talking to the settlement offer in 2001 and he was bragging about sabotaging. Mm. The, he was talking to us like, I sabotage it, like there was going to be no yeah. peace. Yeah, you've seen that, right? Yeah. And in that video, if you remember, when, when he was saying like, you have to hit them hard, 2001, no Hamas at the time. Mm. We have, they were talking about the Palestinian Authority. We have to hit them, we have to kill them, we have to make them feel the pain. And then one of them says like, like Bibi, but wouldn't America kind of just like, so what? The American public is easily manipulated. 80% are with us. It is absurd. And as a new American, mm -hmm. where I can have the um, privilege of being retrospectively angry, I said, like, this guy is mocking the government who is, and the people who have been with him all the time. It's like, oh, they can be easily manipulated. They can do it. And even, by the way, even Isaac Rabin, Isaac Rabin, the, the, the one who actually did the peace accord. He was known famously said the way to actually beat those children is to break their bones with the broken bones policy. They were like, get those kids and break their bones on the pavement. So this has, it, the whole idea about like Israel wanted peace and Arabs only wanted to fight is a very, very actually, bad representation. I actually think as, it, as it's gone on, the will, the genuine will on both sides for peace has not existed. No. I think it's been a deceit to the world. Uh, no, I'm sorry. And, and to the relative groups of people on both sides the official and, and actually a betrayal of them. the official stand of the Palestinian Authority and again I cannot speak I mean, it is very difficult to do this the official stand of the Palestinian Authority is that we are just happy with 22% of the land just give us like that yes there are people that this but the thing is you cannot just say okay let's talk about peace and then you take away my land let's talk about peace and th there's there's a kind of like passive aggressiveness happening oh let's talk about it, but I'm gonna build settlements I'm going to suffocate your cities and your villages. You see, I think I'm that has been incredibly inflammatory. Yes. Worsening the situation. I think putting back the chance of peace. I mean, Netanyahu, I, I interviewed Netanyahu earlier this year in the middle of the big social protests in his own country. And I couldn't understand what he thought he was doing, except that it seemed to me political expediency that he had to, to get power, uh, you know, again, he had put a bunch of right-wing headbangers into his cabinet who have incredibly bad records, speak in an incredibly incendiary way about uh, Palestinians, for example. And that he did this for power. And then he launched, a, because they were pushing him to do it, a ridiculous assault on the integrity of the Supreme Court, the independence of the Supreme Court. And, and many Israelis rose up. So mm -hmm. Netanyahu is, has become, to me, a big problem. Right, and, and the people, that all the polling shows that. Israeli people are very unhappy with Netanyahu. I don't think he's ever going to actually want to forge peace. And in fact, I think he was instrumental with Hamas in wanting to keep them in power because he felt that that would create the split with the Palestinians, yeah. with two political groups, and that would be good for Israel. And it was leaked in a Likud uh, conference in 2019 yeah. that he was bragging about giving Hamas money because this is a way that we can keep Palestinian divided and yet, so we, we and we'll never have one. So this is a guy who but, was. But, but look, we can agree about Netanyahu. I think. No, right? but not just Netanyahu. There, there's a book. And, and, there, and I would say most of his cabinet. There, there's that. a book called The Fear of Peace. It's by, by Moshe Zimmerman, mm. and he's an Israeli historian. And he said, like, the average Israeli citizen does not have a vision of peace, mm. because for 70 years this is a country that has been. The military, the war has been going on for a while. Yeah. They have been expanding because of war. The military is taking over. So the whole idea of peace is not even there. Yeah. It's not just Netanyahu. Like, like you have, I remember you have interviewed uh, Naftali Bennett. Yes. And I think you tweeted that like that was like uh, a very um, kind of reasonable take. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I said reasonable. No. Yeah. Yeah. But like I, I, this Naftali, in the, he went after Queen Rania. Yeah. And he called up shame on Queen Rania. No, 